Uh, hi, everyone. It's such a wonderful pleasure to invite you to the second of the two-part March 2024 special edition of Living Histories. Um, it's an incredible honor to launch into this special edition with Cindy Tang from Stanford University. Stan Cindy, I am so excited to hear your Living Histories. Please tell us. Great. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to be here to share with you my journey. Um, so I was born and raised in Hong Kong, and I was the first one to go to college in my extended family. My love for science and engineering really comes from my father, who is kind of like a jack of all trades. He was an electrician, maybe a mechanic at some point, and he... Um, basically just likes to take things apart and then fix them and then put them back together. And I would sit next to him to see what he's doing. And then he would explain to me how things work. My mom, on the other hand, is kind of like a typical uh, tiger mom. Uh, she would instill in me and my sister strong work ethics as early as race school. She would not let me or my sister say, I'm not good at math or I'm not good at chemistry as an excuse to do poorly at school. Instead, she makes us believe that everything is achievable if we just work hard enough. I was not interested in biology at all when I grew up, mostly because the way it was taught, it was purely focused on memorization, and I wasn't really interested in that. After high school in Hong Kong, I went to qualify for my undergrad. I was an electrical engineering major in part because of my father, who was an electrician, but actually the major didn't really matter because a lot of the curriculum at Caltech as an undergrad was math and physics, and a lot of the classes were very theoretic theoretical. And that gave me a really strong quantitative foundation, even though after graduating, I didn't feel like I qualified to become a real electrical engineer and work in a company. One of the most useful things that I learned from Caltech was how to be resourceful and independent in seeking knowledge in part because <laughs> a lot of classes, the lectures were not related to the homework and the homework was not related to the exams. So in order to survive Caltech, we really got to figure out how to find resources outside of the class materials. After Caltech, I was actually not going to go for a PhD. And so it'll be a separate story and maybe we can discuss that in Q&A. Um, so I wasn't going to go for a PhD, but until I met my PhD advisor, George Whiteside at Harvard. George is a chemist, but he works on research topics that are really across disciplines. And here I actually took a snapshot of his website just like yesterday. And you can see that he works on stuff from adaptive materials, biophysics, microfluidics, soft robotics, origin of life. It's like a whole universe of problems. And I was just blown away by the breadth of topics that he studies in his research lab and also the people that he brought together in his lab from chemists, physicists, engineers, mathematicians. It was just a wonderful place to be. And there in his lab, I learned to have the courage to take on new questions without knowing anything about it. My PhD ended up, ended up being um, a, uh, the topic was on upper fluidics, in particular, making optical components using liquid-liquid interfaces like a liquid lens. So this is a movie of uh, a liquid lens that I made in the microfluidic channel for my PhD days. And from here, I started thinking about how can we build materials and systems that are reconfigurable, dynamic, and also self healing. Now, in my PhD, I was exposed to more biology and resource setting, but I was always playing a more supportive role, like making a microfluidic device to capture cells or writing some code to analyze imaging data. And um, the pivotal moment that sparked my interest in biology was in 2011, when I went to the physiology course at Woods Hole, where I met Wallace Marshall. And I believe that he also spoke earlier in the series. And it was right before the start of my faculty position at Stanford. Wallace told me about this crazy single cell organism called Stantor ceruleus, that you can apparently cut it in many small pieces. And as long as each piece has some nuclear material, not only can it heal, it can also regenerate the entire organism that's fully functional. 
And that just like blew my mind. I was like, this is the holy grail of science and engineering and material science. Imagine you can break your computer in two and only can you get the computer to heal completely, but you also get two functional, fully functional computers. So right there, right there, and I decided that I have to, I have to study this organism and figure out what is the secret. So since 2011, I've been collaborating with Wallace on Stanford Cerulius. And the first thing that we decided we have to do is to come up with a better way to wound the cells so that we can better and more reproducibly study the wound healing phenomena. And we come up with this microfluid guillotine, which you're looking at the movie on. And it really allows us to cut the cells in a much more reproducible and high throughput way. And from there, we're able to characterize the uh, healing rate and also the largest wounds that Stanter can heal. And perhaps no surprise, Stanter was outperforming most of the other cells that were recorded. This is still a very active area of research in my lab. We're just starting to scratch the surface to discover some really fascinating ways that the single cell is healing extreme wounds. As I was reflecting on my journey into biophysics and bioengineering, I realized that if I, if I had known about all the superpowers that these single cells and microorganisms have, I might have become interested in biology at a much earlier age. And I just wish that grade school biology, at least where I grew up, would at least have some discussion of these crazy organisms. So with the support of NSF, my team is putting together a website and other resources to highlight some of these organisms and their superpowers with the hope that the younger generation would find them as exciting as I do. Last, I just wanna briefly say that a lot of my research has been curiosity driven, but in 2018, I participated in the Stanford Biodesign Program, which forced me to approach problems from the opposite end, which is to start with an unmet need and then go find a simple solution. It was really interesting experience. And from there, I started a couple of new research arcs in my lab, including food allergy research, tumor organoid research, and spatial proteomics. So I know I'm almost out of time. So she, you asked me to share any take home message and I got two for you. First, don't be afraid to take on an unconventional problem. And second, it's actually from my fortune cookie from Panda Express, which is stuck to my monitor that opportunity knocks every day, be sure to answer it. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank my wonderful group of students, postdoc, research scientists, and also collaborators. And thank you for your um, invitation to share with you my experience and journey. Uh, thank you so much, Cindy. On behalf of the audience, I'm clapping. Um, thank you for a wonderfully interesting talk. Let me start by asking the, the question you asked us to ask you. And in the meantime, invite the audience to send me more questions via chat, which is, if not a PhD, what was your secret plan? I was going to work, yeah. So I was, I, I thought that, oh, maybe I'll be an electrical engineer. And, um, and since Caltech was so theoretical, so I ended up going to Stanford, I, I skipped that part to get a master's degree in electrical engineering, which um, was a, little, a lot more hands-on. And I feel like, okay, maybe I'll, I have enough skills to actually work in a company as an electrical engineer. But along the way, during my year at Stanford, I got introduced to actually some of the alumni at, uh, from Caltech, uh, uh, George Whiteside and I, I happened to be in Boston and I was able to get a meeting with George and I was just blown away and that was it. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I'm gonna work for you, George. But yeah, but before that, I thought maybe I'll work in a company or something like that. I see. Uh, this segues nicely to an audience question, which is, I think, uh, uh, hat tip to the, 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 the article by George that many of us have read about how to write a paper. Uh, and the question is about what specifically did you learn from him about how to write a paper? Um, everything. I think that's a really wonderful process that he has um, uh, put into his lab. Some of you might know George is very busy, so he's usually not there in person. But um, the way that we have been getting most of the advising from him is through these papers uh, outline system that will submit everything 
in like hard copy and put it in a very specific type of folder and with like the end date and then, and then we'll, uh, we'll have out date. And then we have like a cover letter telling, okay, what is the, uh, this outline, this manuscript draft is about and what are the updates, what, how we have addressed your comments. And then he will hand write his comments on those hard copy manuscript drafts and then like circle things like, okay, this is wrong. And so this is how I really learned from him, from his handwritten comments on my manuscript drafts. And I think it's a really wonderful system that I try to use in my group, but I I realized that just handwriting is too uh, too slow for me. So I know just using track changes, but that's still a very important process I have uh, kind of still using these days in a more electronic version. Thank you. Uh, last question, when you're not being a scientist or thinking about science or thinking about organisms, is there a side of your life that looks very different that you want to share with us? Yeah, so I have a son who is three and a half. So these days, if I'm not working on science, <laughs> I am taking care of him, running out to him. And and it's actually really cool because he's an age that he's very curious about everything. And and I get to tell him, oh, like, this is how things work. And then sometimes we'll ask questions that I actually have no answers to. And then I'll do, oh, I got to look up how this works. So it's really wonderful just playing with my son and, you know, just teaching him things and about science and engineering. Uh, thank you so much on that very humanizing note. I am uh, closing the recording.